really sorry that I can't make it to Seoul today, but unfortunately, um, my life has somewhat imploded this week and therefore I can't uh, really make it. I am hopeful that I'd be able to deliver this in a more interactive fashion online um, sometime soon in the in future. I have no uh, disclosures to make. Okay, so by this stage of the symposium, I imagine that you have a good understanding of why we want to analyse cortical signals on a surface instead of a volume. But the purpose of this talk is to highlight um, that classical surface analyses still have their limitations. And that's because most of the techniques that you've heard about today rely at least to some extent on surface registration, which is known as an ill-posed problem. Uh, and what that means is there are many different ways that you can map one location in an individual brain to a location in another brain. For example, if we consider the 32K cortical surface, then there are 32,000 by 32,000 um, different mapping combinations. And combinatorially, that's um, a difficult and computationally costly space to explore. And regardless, um, we now have a pretty good understanding of the macroscopic organisation of the cortex and therefore most people would be sceptical if we saw a mapping that mapped some location in the frontal lobe from one individual to the visual cortex in another. And so for those reasons, most surface and volumetric registration algorithms implement what are known as diffeomorphic constraints um, imposed through biophysically inspired regularization terms that um, enforce a smooth and invertible mapping. But the idea here is that you're not going to stretch or shear your images too much locally or allow any um, overlapping or tearing of the warp. And so we can see an example of this here for volumetric registration where this brain image is smoothly deforming until its shape or its cortical folds more closely overlap with um, the um, equivalent folds in a target subject. Um, but the problem with diffeomorphisms is that while they are going to allow us to smoothly and non-rigidly um, grow our images, which means that different locations in the image can deform in different ways and regions can grow closer together or further apart, what they absolutely prohibit is any um, swapping of the locations of regions or the splitting apart of regions or collapsing of regions into nothing. And when you really look at the types of variability that we observe across humans, you realise that then this isn't enough. Um, so the example that I always give is um, the results of the HCP cortical aerial parcellation, which indicated that in some areas just might not be present in some individuals, but also um, explained at length um, uh, the example of the orange region 55B here, um, so here's 55B, usually it's bordered either side by the frontal and posterior eye fields. But in a sizable subset of individuals, 55B is split and the posterior and frontal eye fields merge. And in some subjects, 55B swaps locations with the frontal eye fields. And none of these types of mapping would be allowed under a diffeomorphism. Um, and there are, of course, other approaches to functional alignment, which completely drop um, diffeomorphic constraints. For example, probably the most widely known is the hyperalignment approaches that have come out of the Haxby lab. And these are matching vertices based on the similarity of the dynamics of the fMRI time series. And while I, um, I, you know, there's no doubt I see great value in the direction of these methods. Um, in my opinion, uh, at this stage, removing all biophysically informed constraints um, isn't the way to go because you are then at risk of learning noisy mappings that are um, driven by the physiological noise that remains in the data. And so for all these reasons, I'm here to advocate for use of deep learning. And the reason for that is that, you know, um, deep learning for images arose uh, to deal with this very problem, to allow us to compare images without them having to be aligned at all. And the most, fam the most famous probably or the most well-known deep learning framework for image understanding is a convolutional neural network. Um, and these work by comparing images through what are known as convolutional filtering operations. So we learn um, a huge bank of filters at different resolutions that learn to detect different textures and patterns and, in deep, and at higher levels indeed full, um, uh, learn to detect full objects in the image. Um, 
And this works essentially by learning these three by three filter kernels uh, where the weights or the parameters of these kernels are learned during training. Um, and the convolution operation itself works essentially by translating these kernels across the image and comparing the kernel parameters with the image features at each location. So if we look at this in more detail, um, then essentially uh, here we're looking at a convolution across a patch of this image which is um, highlighted here. So these values in this box here exactly um, uh, reflect the intensities in this image patch and uh, what we do during convolution is we take our 3x3 three three kernel and we um, compare it, we, we overlay it with our image at some location and then we perform an element-wise multiplication sum with the corresponding locations in the filter and the image. So you've got W1 times 55 here and W2 times 60, W3 times 65 um, and so on. So you uh, multiply them together and then sum up all the terms to get a value and this becomes a value in the a new image which is the output of the convolution. This image is um, slightly low, uh, its output size is slightly less because these values correspond to the center pixel and therefore you can only get as many um, outputs as you can fit your filter kernel fully into your image. And so you make these comparisons at every location that you can fit a filter kernel by translating the kernel um, to the right each time and performing the same operation. And you continue this along each row, then move down one row and along the next row until you generate an entire convolutional um, image. And that image, um, depending on what layer in the convolutional neural network you are, learns to detect different uh, textures in the image. So at early, early layers, they learn to become edge detectors. So we see clearly that at this uh, border um, here, we've got an edge. And the output, the convolutional image, is highlighting that edge. Um, and so over many layers, uh, these convolutional neural networks uh, learn to detect these, these edge, uh, edge structures, textures, and individual objects. And they do this um, through downsampling. So all the way through, you're learning three by three kernels. But as you downsample the um, output of the convolutions, those, the scale of those images, the amount of the image that they're capturing becomes bigger such that at the final layers of the network an individual 3x3 three three filter can learn to activate for an individual object such as a flower or a face. And importantly this convolutional filtering operation is equivariant to the symmetry transformations of the domain where the symmetry group is referring to the class of transformations that's being used to um, transform the filter across the domain. So as we've just seen for 2D and 3D images, that's a translation. But for a sphere, it would be a rotation. An equivariance just means that the output of the operation is transforming in the same way as the input. So we can see this for this video um, of an Eskimo here. So here, if we transform our view of the Eskimo across the scene, then the output of our convolution stays exactly the same but transforms in exactly the same way, and that's equivariance. And then if we combine this equivariant property with pooling um, over these layers, it in the end makes the CNN invariant to these operations, which means that it would be able to detect an object wherever it is translated across the scene. And then in addition to this, um, many people realise that if we augment or supplement our input data set with, by, by transforming our examples, then we can um, learn to make the network invariant to more types of transformation. So, for example, we could simulate more biological variability uh, through applying linear or nonlinear transforms of the data. Uh, so we could rotate some of our inputs, we could stretch some of them, we can nonlinearly deform them, we can simulate the MRI bias field, we can simulate noise, and this creates an appearance of a much bigger input data set than we had to start with, and that can generate networks that generalize um, much better. Uh, but it's important to understand that the filtering operation itself is not equivalent to any of these transforms. So what you're doing when you train a network in this way is training a bigger network with more filter kernels that can learn 
um, all of these sources of variability. And so this then becomes a trade-off uh, where the more parameters you have, the more network li likely the network is to overfit um, and not generalize to unseen data sets. So you have to be careful. Um, and then, uh, moreover, if we try and translate the convolutional kernel operation to surfaces, we run into new problems. And that's because um, depending on what path we... Well, so the, the underlying problem is that um, surfaces have... Surface man surfaces or non-Euclidean domains have no global coordinate system. So unlike 2D, 3D domains where you have the X, Y, and Z coordinates, our coordinates, our coordinates change as we move across the surface. We have to work in the tangent plane. And so we have no global coordinate system. And that also means that when we transform our filters along different paths, then we end up with filters of very different orientations. So for example, let's consider this star our filter with a blue point at the top and green on the left and red on the right here. If we take it over the blue path, then when we get to the back side of the, at the opposite side of the sphere, the filter's turned upside down. On the other hand, if we go around the red path, then um, what we get when we go along the red path is that uh, our filter is instead turning, um, it's flipping left right. Um, so now we have um, the red point at the bottom on the left and the green on the right. And so you can see that these two filters have different orientations. Um, and so if we were to implement our surface filtering operations in exactly the same way that we do for our Euclidean domain by defining some sort of um, grid or tessellation and defining our filters on that tessellation and just comparing them with the image properties at that location, then what we get are convolutional operations that are in no way invariant to the transformations of the data. And this has been done uh, by the popular spherical unit framework that um, was published in Mikai 2019. And it has some advantages because those filters themselves have no constraints and therefore are fully expressive. But the, out the operations that you get are in no way um, invariant to transformations of the data. So if you don't have your data very well aligned in the first place, then it's not going to work very well. And I would argue that then that somewhat defeats the whole purpose of using deep learning. Um, so technically, actually, the correct way to implement non-Euclidean uh, convolutions is in the spectral domain because the um, using the uh, convolutional theorem, which states that the Fourier transform of the convolution of an image in a filter is equal to the product of their Fourier transforms. Um, so then we can just generalize Fourier transforms to the domain of interest. So we could use spherical harmonics for the sphere or the eigenvectors of the graph Laplacian for any sort of generalized shape mesh. However, implementing convolutions in this way is very, are very, it's very computationally costly. And so what happens is that the methods that use this, these types of approaches implement approximations, which lose filter expressivity. And then that becomes a problem if you're trying to learn very complex textures in your image data. Um, so in summary, implementing convolutions for surfaces isn't straightforward because it is not uh, easy to implement them in a mathematically correct way um, that is computationally efficient. Um, and further, your best choice of, of, there are many different approaches because there are many different non-Euclidean domains. You can go from trying to model protein um, molecules to protein-protein uh, interaction networks to social networks, financial networks, shape. And so you have to be careful that you choose a uh, framework that is suitable to your problem. Um, that being said, the field continues to evolve uh, with the advent of uh, what are known as message passing schema, which um, Comrade, I am sure, will talk about in more detail in his talk that comes after mine. But in brief, these achieve more transformation invariance, or they achieve permutation invariance anyway, to the ordering of the network, um, the vertices, um, when you're performing your convolutional operation, because they define your convolutional operations from some sort of generic aggregation function, uh, such as a sum, a mean, or a max. Um, and these can then learn powerful filters that put no constraints on the parameters of the network um, 
that uh, learn to be invariant to the ordering of your vertices and the number of vertices that you have in any neighbourhood. And besides, um, despite all these limitations, we can do some really powerful things with surface convolutions. So I'm not trying to uh, discredit them at all. I'm just, as you'll see in a few slides time, saying that there is another way of doing this that, are simple, that is simple and intuitive. So we have used surface convolutional neural networks very successfully. For example, um, Logan, um, I'm sure he's already told you, used um, surface convolutional neural networks to generalize the HCP aerial parcellation to the much noisier data of the UK Biobank um, in ways that strongly outperformed the vertex-wise classifiers that were originally used for the um, HCP paper, um, in the HCP Nature paper. Um, we've also used surface CNNs to perform a range of image processing tasks. So here I'm showing an example of learning-based image registration, uh, the geomorph framework um, that was developed by Mohammed Suleiman. Um, so this is essentially a learning-based implementation of MSM with the advantage that it, mu it runs much faster than the original implementation of MSM, generalizes across data sets, um, performs as well as MSM all, but really the long-term objective for this type of framework is to create um, an environment which we can start to learn better uh, regularization terms that will allow us to break free of different morphisms, but in a much more sort of principled way. And we can also use surface CNNs to build deep normative models of neurodevelopment that show us how individual brains should develop over time whilst preserving their unique cortical morphology and microstructure. And so these can then be compared against ground truth, follow-up data. So here we're showing um, ground truth scans for a preterm baby. Uh, they were scanned around 34 weeks and then at a term equivalent age. And we can see that we can use surface convolutional neural networks to model the, um, the growth of that baby's brain in ways that preserve that baby's individual cortical morphology which wouldn't be possible with methods such as um, Gaussian processes that are going to model the mean of a population. And then we can compare these individual, the simulation of how we expect the individual to develop if they're healthy to their ground truth and use that um, to see how much that individual is deviating from healthy controls over time. Um, but that all being said, our objective in this tutorial or my objective in this tutorial is to instead offer you an alternative framework that is both powerful, versatile, and relatively intuitive to use. And for this, we're going to turn to what are known as visual vi vision transformers. So these actually work by taking an image um, and then patching it into um, regions and then treating those patches like any other sequence learning problem. So, for example, the most well-known use of transformers is for, for language modeling or audio modeling. Uh, for example, they're integrated into chat GPT. And by doing this, it should be possible to see that the model is imposing much fewer assumptions, otherwise known as inductive biases, on how it models the data. And... Um, that makes it much easier to translate this framework to a generic surface manifold, uh, where this was done by uh, Simon Dahan, who um, has also put together a, hope, uh, a really intuitive tutorial for you, showing how to generalize this framework to your data, uh, and we'll play that after this, this talk. But essentially, all we really need is some way of patching up the surface in a consistent way across all data sets. And for that, we use icospheres. So icospheres are regular tessellations of spheres, um, which um, uh, you can um, upsample and downsample in a very simple and intuitive way just by adding or removing vertices at the center um, of each edge. Um, and then this allows us to set up a surface vision transformer in pretty much exactly the same way as we do for a conventional vision transformer. Um, so our cortical feature maps, where in this particular case, um, uh, we've got circle depth maps. These are resampled to a high resolution icosphere. Usually we use ICO6, which has 41,000 vertices, which I would say was more than enough. Um, and then this data is patched with a lower resolution icosphere, usually ICO3, which has 100, which has 
1,280 faces. Um, and each one of these patches is then referred to as a token. And those tokens are then flattened and compressed with a linear embedding um, layer into shorter sequences. And then sine, cosine functions are added to each token in order to force the network to um, remember the locations of each patch relative to its neighbors, because otherwise we've chucked this away. Um, uh, so this is known as positional embedding. So I'm going to go through the details of vision transformers very fast, but uh, very soon I will upload to YouTube one of our, um, our AI lectures on um, all of the architectural de details of vision transformers that should um, further help you understand how these work. I'll update, I will upload all of this to YouTube uh, and I'll provide links at the end of the talk. Okay, so yes, uh, data is resampled to ICO6, it's patched with ICO3, um, concatenated across channels so you can simultaneously model cortical folding a myelin, flattened to a, a shorter input sequence, and then these cosine embeddings are added to encode location. Um, there are many uh, important details involved in these networks, but essentially all of these network architectures are exactly the same as you'd use to, to model language or 2 or 3D data. So the only thing that's really different is how you do the patching. Um, and, it, and to understand why vision transformers are so powerful or why transformers are so powerful, the, thing, the main thing you need to understand is how multi-head self-attention works. Um, so essentially what this is doing is training weights matrices to learn a query key and uh, value matrix and these um, essentially are then modeling co-occurrences or spatial, spatial autocorrelations in the you know long range spatial autocorrelations in the data in order to build up some sort of holistic understanding of the scene um, and that's useful for brain imaging data because we know that uh, most cortical phenotypes or most diseases that impact the cort cortex are diffuse and impact distant regions. And uh, we need to know that things are happening together in order to make a diagnosis, for example. So the first uh, two terms we need to think about are the query and the key. And essentially what these are doing are learning some similarity or, or association between these tokens or patches. Um, and we learn both a query and a key and not just one representation for each token to ensure that this uh, operation is directional, which means that we need to um, the design the network in such a way that the importance of token I to understanding or predicting token J is not the same as uh, in the reverse, so predicting token J from token I. And this makes sense for language learning. So, for example, this sentence gives a clear example. So, Evan's dog Riley is so hyper, she never stops moving. And um, it's much more important in terms of sentence context to know that the name Riley refers to the dog and not the human than, to, than that we really care what the name of the dog is. And so um, for those reasons, the importance of um, uh, Riley to the understanding of dog is different. Uh, calculated in a different way as the importance of the word dog to the understanding of the word Riley. Um, and so we have these, uh, we compare the encoding for, the, the query encoding for dog with the key encoding for Riley and vice versa, and don't just learn these key matrices because we need to learn these directional relationships. Um, and I think this also generalizes to the brain. My intuition is that this directional self-attention relationship is helping us ensure some level of robustness to noise and greater understanding of what's going on. Because if we consider, for example, resting state activations, then we know that they're distributed and that the presence of activity in one brain area is generally associated with correlated patterns of brain activity in others. And so if, it, if, it, if we don't see presence of activation in some other area, then it may just be indication that at that point it's just physiological noise. Um, and learning this self-attention mechanism also gives us a clear intuition for what the model, if we visualize it, we have a clear intuition for what the model is doing when it's, when it's, when it's 
um, when it's learning some problem. So, because um, we can look at what um, the output token is attending to um, with respect to the image, with the output token being the classification token. If we can see what this is what what this is attending to in order to make its prediction, then we have some understanding of what the model is doing. So here, for example, we have a model trained on to predicting how old a baby is when they are scanned from their sulcal depth and myelin maps. And we can see that over this late period of gestation, so here we have a baby at 32 weeks and here at 40, there's a rapid increase in myelination of the somatomotor strip and the folds are getting deeper. And so if we look at the attention maps for the two babies, so one here, the 32-week and the 42-week, then we can see that the model is looking at different things at different times. Um, at 32 weeks, it's really attending to whether there is myelination or not, and it's also looking at the depth of folds in the temporal parietal junction, whereas at 40 weeks, it's paying more attention to the insula and the folding in the temporal lobe, which we know develops later. And then the final output normalizes these attention weights um, and multiplies them with the va token values such that the um, output uh, or out output tokens from each layer are integrating the information. Um, the new value of each token is going to integrate information from all of the other tokens in order to create some new value for that token. Um, again, using the example in terms of language, then you can see that the new value for the dog and ran is a weighted combination combination of the tokens from the other from the, the from the previous layer. Um, and so we are learning how important different tokens are for the understanding of that um, that that for being able to predict or understand what's going on in that token, and we're carrying that forward through the network. Um, so this is the basics of how the transformers work. They are super flexible, but it is important to be aware that they do have their own limitations. So one of these is that the complexity of the self-attention operation scales with the um, length of the sequence. And so this actually limits the maximum possible resolution of the patches that you use. We can get around this by um, generalizing what are known as SWIN transformer frameworks to the surface. So these work by essentially um, learning uh, shifted window attention. So you learn, uh, you first learn attention at high for high resolution tokens, just within some um, low resolution patch of the data. So again, because it's icosphere, they're triangular. So we're learning attention only within this yellow patch um, using uh, tokens which are represented by this white tessellation. And then in order, because these are isolated, in order to learn attention across the, the surface, you shift these a little bit so that then you can learn attention between these overlapping patches. Then what you do is you over a series of levels or layers, you downsample um, your uh, token resolution, so your tokens are getting bigger and bigger, but that at the same time you're increasing the scale of your um, self-attention uh, operation. So these patches are covering more and more of the surface until at the lowest resolution, self-attention covers the entire surface, but you're down to a relatively low token resolution. Um, and if we do that, and we use the MSSIT, then we see that our transformers are now strongly outperforming um, surface convolutional approaches. So this is spherical unit, and this is a method known as MONET, on the task of predicting the gestational age of a baby. So how preterm a baby was looking just at a scan taken at a t around term equivalent age. And this is not the easiest of tasks. We can see the transformer it has an error of less than a week. And importantly, um, its performance is more or less consistent if we use data that's been pre-aligned with MSM or if it hasn't been aligned at all. And this really isn't the case for surface convolutional approaches. Um, and then framing learning in this way also allows us to perform dense prediction tasks. So as well as doing prediction, we can do generation theoretically, or we can certainly do segmentation. So this is performance on cortical folding based parcellations um, according to the Desikin Kiliani Atlas. The other issue is, uh, that you may have guessed, that these lack of inductive biases, so the fact that we're not imposing any sort of model, we're not learning local kernels, we're learning um, to model the whole uh, image, uh, means that we're learning networks with 
very many parameters, and this make, tends to make the vision transformers data hungry and prone to overfitting and poor generalization. And this is also true in the natural um, image domain and for uh, audio and language modeling. And um, in those domains, it was originally or has is generally dealt with through self-supervised pre-training. Um, and the most popular method for doing that right now is the masked autoencoder. So the idea of the masked autoencoder is what you're trying to learn to do is that you mask out quite a significant proportion of your image and then you learn to reconstruct the full image from just the patches that remain. And the reason why this is such a powerful self-supervision technique is that essentially you're able to learn a... Um, uh, narrow but deep encoder so because you've got fewer tokens and the complexity of the um, uh, self-attention operation is related to how many of them you have um, by having fewer of them you're allowed to have a deeper network so you can learn more complex representations and uh, more, complica more complex uh, self-attention rep representations across the surface and then you use a wider shallower network to do the decoding and uh, you find that you can mask quite a lot of your data out 50 to 75 percent and still do incredibly well uh, image reconstruction so you see how it's performing at the top here for cortical folding and below it's we're looking at we're modeling um, spatially temporally dynamic data, so the HCP70 fMRI data set. So it's changing in space and time. We're modeling changes in safe space and time. And we're still masking out huge amounts of data and still being able to reconstruct um, the data really well in ways that preserve individual variation, if, as it, even if it's a bit smoother. But the reason why we're doing this is not to reconstruct data. It's actually to take out or extract this encoder and then use it for downstream tasks. And if we do this, what we see is that it enhances the performance of those tasks. Um, so here we've got sex classification from the fMRI data. And if you do the uh, video, masked or, uh, video surface masked autoencoder pre-training, then you can see that the performance is much better than if you train from scratch. And you can also generalize from one data set to the other. So you can take the very large UK biobank data, pre-train your network on it, um, and then apply it to much smaller data sets and see that the performance is improved. So here you can see the performance of um, predicting a baby's degree of prematurity, um, just using 50% of the DHCP data sets so about 300 images to fine tune, you're getting really good performance. Uh, and we all make, we, we've made these pre-trained networks available from our GitHub. So in conclusion, from my experience, I would recommend using surface vision transformers over convolutional neural network approaches because um, they're simple and intuitive to implement. They offer better performance and greater transformational invariance than surface CNNs. We can generalize across data sets and tasks. We can offer you pre-trained networks so you can apply them to much smaller data sets. And they seem to be working really well for univariate, multivariate, and dynamic data sets. And we're now generalizing them to shape.